A very warm welcome from a freezing cold Poland. <laughs> uh, today's session is about the ESA framework. And uh, let me start with some uh, housekeeping. So first of all, um, I want to assure you that the webinar is recorded and you will receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, you will also receive a link to ESAP pack, including a cheat sheet and a planner. And of course, link to, uh, to the recording of this session. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself because I think most of you might not know me. Uh, my name is Magda Kania. Uh, I've been teaching for more or less 25 years. Uh, I have a private school, private language school in Poland, where I'm the director of studies and also I'm the owner. Uh, but also, I also teach. Uh, I am an, a, a teacher uh, and a teacher trainer, as you can see today. <laughs> um, I run regular workshops across Europe and worldwide, and I mm, truly believe that we as teachers uh, should uh, pay attention to the techniques which are efficient and simple. Okay, I don't like exaggeration. I don't like fancy apps which don't bring anything into the classroom apart from having fun. Yes, I'm a kind of a promoter of learning, of our students learning. And privately, I love reading and watching Netflix, of course, I think like most uh, English teachers, I have two adult sons, very independent guys. And I'm also a keen hiker. Actually, I, I've walked the way, the St. Jacob's way six times. So, you know, it's kind of uh, uh, extreme <laughs> walking is my thing. I can see that some of you uh, probably walked St. Jacob's Way uh, too. So hello, Peregrinos. Uh, so that's basically um, everything about me. Uh, I'm very I'm very happy to see you all, guys. Uh, still people coming. Okay. So uh, today, what are what am I going to do today? I'm going to show you the ESAP framework, and I will explain later what uh, ESAP stands for. Um, and mostly, I will try to show you how to craft good online lessons, remembering that an online lesson is still a lesson. Uh, I will also share some tried and tested techniques and resources, some ideas that I have and uh, some tips from me as, a, as an experienced teacher, I guess, and hopefully some positive thoughts, um, even though the situation is as it is around us and we all know what it's like. So, <clears throat> do you recognize this machine? I hope you, you know uh, what it is. Uh, actually, it's a whack-a-mole. It's a game in which a mole uh, pops out of the hole and you have to whack it with a mallet uh, as, as fast as possible. And once you whack it, another mole pops out and then you have to, you have to do the same thing and so on and so on. Uh, and the faster you, you whack the moles, uh, the higher your score. So for me, uh, the situation, the, the beginning of online uh, teaching, what happened in March, April 2020, was more or less like playing whack-a-mole. You know, once I found a solution to one problem, another problem <laughs> appeared and was just a constant game, let's say. And people had different, um, described the situation in different ways. What I found um, online, mostly the description was emergency remote teaching. Yes, people were complaining that what we were doing was not actual teaching, was just emergency remote teaching. And I absolutely agree with that. Uh, some people declared to be officially in panic mode, including me at the beginning, at least. Uh, and some people were just getting by, you know, okay, we survived so many different uh, situations. So it's just, yeah, one more doesn't, doesn't change anything. Uh, but uh, hello, Olga from Spain. <laughs> um, okay, the good news is we survived. Yes, we had to adapt to the situation. And we had to find uh, our way uh, in this whole reality, new teaching reality, new living reality. Uh, everybody knows what I'm talking about. And I have to, you know, uh, say, say more about COVID. It's just the word we don't want to hear uh, anymore. Uh, but we had to adapt. We had to find um, kind of solutions. We had to find the way 
uh, to, to to thrive, to 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 deal with the, the the reality and the teaching context we found ourselves in. Um, and in terms of looking for solutions, um, the group of people at Michigan State University um, created um, the um, the coined a new phrase: um, resilient pedagogy. Uh, basically, what they had in mind was to um, to change the mindset of um, of teachers. Yes, of the the way we work, the way we deal with everything. Uh, what is this resilient pedagogy? It's basically it's a combination of uh, course design principles and teaching strategies that are resistant to disruption and to change in the learning environment that are as resistant to disruption and to change in the learning environment as possible. And actually, I loved it when I saw it. It's, I said, yeah, that's, that's the point. Yes, that's what we need to do. We have to be ready uh, to work um, efficiently in any uh, context. Um, because, you know, some of us, um, well, the, the, since, <clears throat> since April, since Mar Mar March and April, the situation was kind of changing, yes? at least in Poland. We had some times that we were teaching online, then we moved into the classrooms and the, the lessons were face to face, like traditionally. And then we again, we were kind of shifted into an online teaching. And sometimes in, in some situations, it was um, there was a new term like hybrid teaching. Uh, in my context, it was it looked like that um, I had some students uh, face to face, but some of the students who couldn't attend the lesson because of COVID or, or anything, um, some, something else, uh, they took part in a lesson online. Okay, so I had a laptop in my classroom and uh, I was, you know, having a lesson with my students in the classroom with the, the online students. Um, kind of participating, yes, but you know this participation was not um, was not that good. And I thought, okay, so now how can I how can I plan my lessons to make them effective and you know just engaging for for both groups of of students? Um, and resilient pedagogy is this idea that um, they, they 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 claimed that we need to find a structure, uh, a framework that will work in any teaching context. It was kind of a saving thing for me. Uh, and more or less at the same time, a group of experts at Pearson, I had the privilege to work with, um, kind of designed this um, ESAP framework, uh, which is online teaching methodology ESAP, okay? Where ESAP stands for Engage, Study, Activate, Practice. And the idea is here that we should, um, when we have this framework, we, sh we can plan our lessons in such a way that we just break it into four different steps, four different stages. Um, and I will show you uh, how it helps. And um, for me, the greatest thing about uh, this uh, framework was that it reduced my workload, which was, you know, fantastic. Um, and um, we are talking about ESAP in online as online teaching methodology, but actually you will see, I hope, that once you implement this framework into your teaching, uh, you will see um, that it's just so easy to, to transfer it into any teaching context, whether you teach online or in the classroom or teach face-to-face, -face, um, you can still use this framework to make sure that your lessons are engaging and uh, effective and just don't uh, take uh, too much of your time when planning. So what do we what do we start with? First thing we need is the access to uh, Pearson English portal. I hope you I hope you have uh, you already have an account. If you don't have it, don't worry. Creating an account takes I don't know like 2 minutes, but please don't do it now. You just have to go to the website Pearson uh, Pearson English portal. And um, <clears throat> you will find uh, the um, registration uh, page. Uh, you can do it after the, the session if you don't have it. And once you are, once you have an account on Pearson English Portal, you can uh, or you should <laughs> activate all the resources um, available. Okay, so if you teach um, from High Note, for example, like I do, and you have your teacher's book. Uh, on the back 
of the front page, you will see a code, a special code, which you have to just click into the website. And once you do it, you will have a plethora of things uh, to use, plethora of resources to use. Okay, you'll have the presentation tool, uh, you will have all the resources, audio, video, everything. Okay, so you don't have to carry your book with you. Just you need the access to uh, to this portal, and you can work online or in your classroom because i will show you that this presentation tool is uh, is basically the interactive whiteboard um um software that you can use um, by using your sharing your screen during the lessons okay but let's have a look at the uh, the the framework so like i said <clears throat> esap stands for engage study activate practice and now i will try to walk you through the stages and tell you uh, what kind of content and what kind of interactions uh, should we plan for um, for every every stage each of the stages okay so we start with the engage when we plan our lesson um, i have it um, it looks like 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 that when i plan my lesson i have a piece of paper of course you can do it um, on um, on your on your on your computer you don't have to do it on paper i'm old fashioned you know and i just like to print it and use my pen uh, so what i do is that i plan the first part of my lesson and the first part is supposed to engage my students yes i want to warm them up uh, i want them to feel engaged uh, because you know when we teach online the competition is incredible there is facebook there is netflix there's the bad that calls students to go back to so we need to start with something that will make um, our students want to stay with us for the whole lesson yes the, mostly usually we call it a warm-up but i like the word an appetizer and that's what i what i use when i think about engaging my students i want to whet my students appetite i want them to see that what we're going to do is going to be fascinating and fantastic okay so i usually start with something engaging but what is even more important i try to um kind of um, use the activities that um, activate our prior knowledge yes i want to make sure that student when we start the lesson uh, students have the um, the base that the um, you know uh, kind of the um, the background the base that they can connect the new things uh, with because that's the that's the way uh, learning happens yes when you connect what, what you know with something new that's how you remember um, something uh, the content better uh, and I also use a lot of in, in retrieval practice uh, like the, the kind of tasks in which students have to retrieve some information from uh, from the memory <clears throat> from their long-term memory yes I, I want them to bring something uh, that they remember if they don't remember I just make sure that when they take part in an activity they can remind um, and kind of recall some some things thanks to the other students for example okay so of course when we teach online we can use what we have when we have a fantastic work, um, course book why not use it you know there's no need to reinvent the wheel somebody created a fantastic thing so and uh, so that's that's what I usually start with. And uh, so on your Pearson, um, Pearson English portal, um, when you click on the icon of your course book, uh, like here is focus, um, you just have to click at presentation tool and it takes you straight into the digital version of your uh, course book. Uh, and as you can see, uh, all lessons uh, in focus and in high note uh, start with an uh, activity which is uh, in a way engaging but also um, activates prior knowledge and there is some retrieval practice in it yes like for example we start with show what you know that's the point yes that's what we have to start with uh, check what students already know about the topic so that it will be easier for them to connect new information um, so quite often I use the activity which the book offers 
um, because it's always, you know, always uh, worth doing, and it saves my time. I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, create uh, new activities. Um, and in this case, um, it's just the first part of the task is to retrieve some of the vocabulary, um, like retrieve the meaning of the vocabulary of the words, because of course they can see the words here, and they just have to match it with the sentences. So that's how we check whether they understand and, and remember um, how the words function in context. Uh, and the next stage is mm, <clears throat> the part in which we want our students to compare the sentences and discuss their habits. Okay, so, well, who doesn't like to talk about, you know, yourself? Well, maybe maybe not me, but I have a lot of friends who like talking about themselves. So for them, that would be a lovely activity. Yes, yeah? like oh my goodness, I can now share some of my ideas. Uh, so basically, what I do here is I put students into breakout rooms uh, and ask them to uh, to change their opinions, to compare their habits in the breakout rooms. I give them two or three uh, three minutes. <clears throat> so as you can see, I do not start with something that they have to fill in the exercises, they are engaged from the very first minute of, uh, of our lesson. Um, but I, or sometimes I don't use what the book offers. Uh, actually, I have this special box, I will show you, this special box full of uh, ideas and activities, uh, which I collect, um, I think I have collected for like 20, 20 years probably. Uh, <clears throat> different activities and ideas that I find in different books or during the conferences or different sessions, like teachers share some, some of the uh, fantastic um, activities. And I simply note them down and I can use them anytime I want. I make sure they are um, effective and engaging. And one of uh, such activities is the alphabet race. And actually that's something I like to start my lesson with. It's one of the retrieval practice uh, techniques that I use. Um, what I need, uh, what I need is basically um, a piece of paper, or I don't need it. If you teach online, you don't you don't have to create a, a piece of paper. When I teach face to face, I print the page with the alphabet. When I teach online, I create a Google uh, Docs in which I simply write um, the alphabet, and I ask my students. Uh, to look at the, because the, as you can see, that's the moment when we start a new unit, a new, um, a new notion, a new topic, and uh, it's just learning for life, yes? So what I did um, at the beginning of this lesson, I asked my students to retrieve all the words that they remember, that they, they can somehow uh, connect with uh, learning. Uh, what is great in this kind of activity is that different students remember different things. And together, uh, we can have a huge amount of vocabulary to start with. Yes, we can see that our students uh, have, um, have a lot of knowledge on the topic. And now it will be easier for them to, <clears throat> to move on. But my absolutely favorite activity to start a lesson uh, to engage my students is <clears throat> using challenging questions. Uh, you can, if you go online, you can find them and this this kind of activity, you can find it um, under the name of thanks, which are the questions, the um, surprising questions which are supposed to make you think. Uh, okay, so so what I do when I know the topic of our lesson uh, will be uh, learning, for example, yes, learning vocabulary or idioms connected with money or cooking, depending on on the topic, I just uh, choose some random words connected with the topic uh, and I create uh, unusual questions like not the obvious like what's your favorite uh, what's your favorite um, subject yeah like oh my goodness how many times <laughs> have our students been asked to answer that question really so what I do I create surprising questions in which I match the words um, in an unusual way, which is not that obvious, because first of all, I want to check whether they understand the meaning. And <clears throat> the second um, thing is that I want them to think outside the box, yes, to think um, in a different way, yes, to go deeper, to dig deeper. Like, for example, I had a lesson about uh, food, 
Um, and I started the lesson with the question, can you find food for thought in a supermarket? And we had an absolutely fantastic discussion um, to start our lesson with. Uh, I, of course, I, I realized that they understand the idea of food for thought and they remember this phrase, which was brilliant. That was exactly uh, my point. Uh, so now, guys, a, 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 a quick break for you and uh, time for me to sip my tea. Can you think of a, an unusual question you can start your lesson uh, with when you have a lesson about learning? Okay, I will give you a minute. <clears throat> learning, brain, <clears throat> studying. <clears throat> Okay, nobody is writing. I hope you are thinking. Okay, can you learn without using your brain? Okay, that's great. <laughs> a hangman is a good one, yes. Oh my goodness, now it's going so so fast. Why will these minutes not be lost time? Mm -hmm. Can you embrace knowledge? When is studying fun for you? Okay, can you learn while sleeping? Are you brainy? I love this one. Okay, what can you spice up your learning? Okay, so you see, it just takes a minute or two to come up with some uh, some crazy and, and fun questions to, to engage your students with. Um, <clears throat> I had this one. Can you know something without knowing that you know it? And it was actually quite difficult for my students to, to answer, but we had a fantastic discussion. Uh, and we started our lesson with, you know, a lot of uh, laughing at, at that point. What motivates you? Okay, fantastic ideas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I think we can uh, we can move on. I hope somebody will copy the chat and we will have you know a plethora of ideas of questions to ask our students. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the next stage uh, in ESAP, and this stage is called study. Uh, of course, this is the um, the part where we um, can introduce new language. Yes, this is the, the, the longest and the slowest part of my lesson. Um, when students are activated, are engaged, so now I can use that and make sure that they really work on the things that we are supposed to, uh, to, to work on at that lesson. So at that stage, I use presentation tool a lot and I s share my screen so that my students uh, can see exactly where, where they should look. Um, I will show you in a minute in, in the next slides. Uh, but at that stage, like, like I said, it's the, the longest part because it's bringing, bringing in the new, con the new content, the new language. I make sure that the activities um, kind of, um, the, the, I vary the type of activities and the pace of the lesson. So I try to make sure that there is a balance uh, between heads up and heads down activities. Yes, heads up. Heads up means that the students are active and they exchange ideas or express some thoughts or or talk to to me or to the other students. And heads down is the type of activities um, that they have to kind of do some exercise on analyze the text or or the structure. Uh, of course, I try to keep my students active. So my main role during this stage is to monitor. Uh, what they do uh, and just check constantly whether they uh, have the understanding, whether they um, really work and do what I, I want them to do. Uh, but it's also important to give our students time to think. Yes, like I asked you a question, I gave you a minute. A minute maybe is not enough, but we are teachers and we are used to <laughs> Uh, you know, coming up with ideas. So for us, maybe it's easier. Um, but our students definitely need time to think, to reflect on what they uh, are working on, yes, to analyze um, the, the, the language. I give them time to think, to notice the language, because, you know, I don't want to, my, I don't, I, I, I don't want my lessons to be like lectures. You know, actually, Graham Nathal, I will show this book later in one of the slides, Graham Nathal in The Hidden Lives of Learners said something uh, fantastic. He said that we all know that students learn by doing. Yes, we know it. <clears throat> so if our students um, 
learn by taking parts in lectures. Uh, they learn that um, learning <laughs> is just passing knowledge from a teacher to student. Okay, because that's what they experience all the time. And that's what they learn. So I make sure that uh, this is the hidden lives of learners. You will see the book on one of the slides later. Uh, <clears throat> I make sure that my students are really engaged into these activities and that they really work on the language. Okay, It's not me giving them the explanations. Of course, I do that also. But first, I try to do everything to make sure that my students are the ones who... Um, who kind of learn themselves yes it's not passing knowledge from me to them uh, and i of course we have to give them time to to think time to think but also time to practice that's why i said that this part is the the longest part uh, and i monitor um uh, at the time they work and i give them feedback very often i give them personalized feedback i write in the chat uh, sometimes i give them group feedback uh, and sometimes I use peer feedback about it a bit later. So this is the part where I squeeze the juice out of the course book. Yes, because the course book gives us everything, gives us the content, gives us the exercises, um, the, the explanations of the, of the structures and everything our students need. Uh, so again, we go to Pearson English Portal, we choose our course book and then um, the lesson that we are working on. And I usually start with the page view because I want my students to see um, exactly, like to know where we are exactly, you know? It's just, I, I just hate the constant questions. What page are we on? Oh, teacher, can you help me? And so on. So look at the screen and my students are used to doing that. Yes, they know that I will show them the page so they don't have to panic uh, or I don't know, pretend you know that they don't know where where to look so i start with the page view <clears throat> uh, and uh, as you can see the content of this lesson mostly is um, focused on introducing new language so in this case it's text about exams um, and vocabulary connected with exams and learning uh, when you uh, next to some of the exercises most of them you can see this yellow star so once you click on this star um, the exercise um, will kind of pop out and you can see this exercise uh, only okay you go from page view to the exercise so that's what I do I share it and my students uh, here as you can see the audio is integrated you don't need any CDs uh, you don't need uh, any 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 anything extra I just have everything here my lessons are 45 60 or 90 minutes depends okay depends what group but mostly it's 60 minutes um, okay, so as, as I said, the, the audio is, of course, integrated. Uh, so I just play the recording and my students can and share my screen. So my students um, listen to, to the recording and they work on their own. Yes, they have their course books. Some of them have their papers, paper books. Uh, they all have access to the digital version of the books. So they just work on their, the, on their own. And after some time, I simply um, check the answers to make sure that uh, they, they know whether what they, what they did is correct or not. Uh, uh, as you can see, there are also the, the, when you see a paper clip, it means that there is a kind of an attachment. And in this case, uh, it's the text that we relate to. Yes, so I simply show them uh, the text again uh, if, they, if they need. Uh, okay. Remember, this is the time to think. This is a very, very important thing. Uh, John Hattie, in his book, uh, Visible Learning for Teachers, said something that uh, was a kind of a game changer for me. <laughs> like the students are given on average one second or less to think, consider their ideas and respond. One second, can you imagine? And what is even more surprising, the brighter students are given longer to respond than the less able. We probably think like, okay, he is so bright, so he might come up with uh, some, some good answers. Yes, like we ignore the less able students, which is, you know, terrifying because uh, actually the less able uh, should have more time. So, <clears throat> 
since I read this, um, this book and I found this quote, I decided to, um, to change it. And whenever I ask a question or ask my students to give, um, to, to work on something and give me the answers, I try to give them at least a minute, <laughs> which is still not enough but it's more than one second, yes? It's really difficult for us teachers. So the only way is to find a way, find your own way to deal with it. So what I do, I have this kind of a, um, a very short poem in Polish, which I say um, in, in, in my mind, yes? When I ask a question and then I just, okay, now I have to wait. So I just, to make sure that I give them enough time, I just repeat it in my, uh, in, my, in my mind so that uh, the time uh, is long enough. Uh, so please remember about it uh, next time you ask a question <laughs> or you ask your, your students to, um, to give you answers to some of the activities, for example. Uh, and like I said before, I give them feedback, but I also use um, peer feedback because um, John Hattie, and again, the same fantastic guy, he said that our students value uh, peer feedback much more than teachers' feedback. Probably because they are used to, uh, to us telling them, oh, great job, fantastic, yes, it was absolutely brilliant. And they just kind of ignore it, probably. It's like, okay, she always says the same thing. I'm not that good, probably. Uh, but when the peers give them feedback or when the peers praise them, it actually matters. So I use peer feedback a lot. And I also use peer teaching. Whenever my students ask me a question, especially during this st study stage, when students ask me a question like, what's the word for something? I rarely answer that. I ask them to ask their friends. It's like, ask free before me, okay? When the free students in our class don't know the answers, uh, or don't know or don't remember the word, then you can ask me and of course I will help you. But you know, here we also have a kind of a retrieval practice <clears throat> um, for other students, yes? So one doesn't remember, the others can just retrieve the information and share it uh, uh, with the others. Uh, Ask Free Before Me also functions, as I, I found it online, functions in a different way. I use that Ask Free Friends Before Me, but Ask Free Before Me is like, ask first ask yourself, are you sure you don't remember this, okay? It probably is somewhere there, the box at the back of your brain. Uh, then ask the task, maybe the answer is in the task. And finally, ask a friend. So I think it's also a good way to, a good thing to, uh, uh, to use um, during, uh, during your, your teaching. Uh, if you have any, um, any any techniques like that or any ideas please share in the in the chat box i'm trying to you know control what you're writing and i would like to i would love to have a a, a new idea to try in my classroom so i would be really really grateful uh, okay, and one more thing here is the book you asked about the hidden lives of learners you can see it on the slide <clears throat> Uh, what Graham Nathal um, um, said also is that <clears throat> the teachers are the not, not the only source of knowledge nowadays. We know that, <clears throat> unfortunately, Google is the source of knowledge, but we also know uh, that uh, we shouldn't always trust Google, especially Google Translate. Yes, when students use Google Translate uh, Translator, I immediately know it because I recognize the uh, the, the funny translations, the unusual translations, yes, the Google Translator doesn't understand uh, some structures and, well, I, I hope, I, I think you have this, you, 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 you feel the same, yes, you immediately know that it's not the person thinking, it's the machine <laughs> thinking. Uh, so we are not the only source of knowledge in the classroom uh, and Graham Nathal mentioned that a significant part of what a student learns is learned through informal, often spontaneous peer interactions. <clears throat> and it might sound surprising for some of you, but it took me, I don't know, 15 years of teaching to realize that. Yes, like I also constantly learn and you know, it's just and now, this was just another game changer for me. Like, oh my goodness, yes, 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 and that's true. I can see it. Why didn't I see it before? So my students really learn a lot from each other. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, uh, I think it is in Polish Chinese. Not the, okay, it's something about Polish Chinese, but I don't know what was it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> How do you stay focused between sharing, speaking, and responding to chat? I cannot do both. Um, you see, um, uh, I don't remember in which book I read about it that there is no such thing as multitasking. But actually, <laughs> um, yeah, there is no such thing. But I don't know. Somehow I manage. I remember once in, in um, uh, when my younger son was in uh, in high school, uh, on the test he had uh, the, he had the vocabulary test at school, and I'm an English teacher, so I know all the English teachers around, right? So uh, one of the words uh, he had on this test was multitasking, and his definition uh, to this word was my mom, <laughs> and his English teacher, of course. <laughs> texted me after the lesson was like oh my goodness your son is fantastic yes i don't know how but i somehow i manage i don't see everything right here so so i'm not that you know fabulous but i try i do my best uh okay so um let's get back to the slides because i kind of it was a kind of a dig 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 digression. Uh, okay, so a significant part of what students learn is learned through informal, uh, spontaneous peer interactions. Remember about that and kind of cherish that. Yes, like what I do, I try to uh, create on my lessons, in my classroom, a learning culture. I show my students that they can learn from uh, one another. Yes, that I am not the only uh, source of knowledge. I have absolutely no problems with telling my students sometimes, guys, I don't know. I don't know the answers. Yes, like some, they ask me about something and I really don't know. It's not a problem for me. I always ask them, okay, I tell them, okay, so maybe now you can teach me something. Or I say, I don't know, but I will find out and we will get back to it uh, next uh, next week or on our next uh, during our next meeting. Um, and at first I was a bit worried uh, that my students might think, oh, my goodness, she's so incompetent. But actually, it turned out that I, um, in a way, I started to create in my classroom a learning culture. I showed my students that we can learn from one another. Uh, so what I keep telling my students is my classroom is a learning community. Yes, I'm not the sage on the stage here. Uh, of course, I know more than, than you, hopefully, like you meaning my students. <laughs> Uh, but we can still learn from one another. So I think uh, at this stage of at the study stage, I think it's good to keep it in mind and make sure that your students um, know that their opinions are valued, that what they know is valued and that they can share and uh, learn from one another. They can teach uh, one another. And we are we, we all know that teaching somebody is the best way to learn something. So that's also uh, the advantage of uh, such uh, attitude. Okay, and my the third stage of the ESAP framework is activate. And it is the part of the lesson in which we want to um, our students to um, produce the language, to practice the language um, using the, the newly acquired skills um, and the, the content, the language that they um, analyzed and learned at the study stage. Uh, so at that um, at that part, in, in this part of the lesson, I make sure that the tasks are personalized because, uh, you know, when we mm, when we when we practice something in context of our own person, it's just fantastic. It helps us remember. Yes, it is easier to remember and easier to retrieve later because it is connected to kind of our memories, our experiences. So it just helps uh, helps us um, to learn and to remember longer. Uh, and of course, I use a lot of pair and group um, um, group work in breakout rooms mostly where I ask my students I put my students into breakout rooms and ask them to work um, um, on something producing something of course I visit them in the breakout rooms and just you know pop, pop inside like okay what's what's going on do you have any problems uh, and um, so what I what I do <clears throat> 
sorry, of course, I use the, the course book quite often. And <coughs> uh, group work in large classes of 100 plus students, is this practically possible? Um, I have no, I have no, uh, no experience with um, working with such uh, huge uh, classes. So uh, I'm afraid I can't help you with that. But you know, breakout rooms. When you have breakout rooms, you can create as many breakout rooms as you want. So you can create breakout rooms of I don't know, ten breakout rooms of ten people. I think it might work. <clears throat> um, Seriously, I can't. Uh, I can't answer <laughs> uh, the, the, this question uh, without uh, saying something, something, something silly. Probably, I have no experience, so, so, I don't know. Uh, okay, but let's get back to 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 what I uh, groups of how many people I have. Basically, we have groups of um, fourteen, fifteen. Yes, because the class is usually 30 and it's divided into half. We have two groups of 15 people. So it's it's OK. I think it's it's quite easy to um, maybe not quite easy, but <laughs> it's doable. Uh, OK, but let's get back to this activate um, stage. Um, mostly, <clears throat> mostly, um, how does that work online, Magda? What? Uh, Joanna Kasprzyk, can you can you um, can you repeat? Because I don't know what you relate to. <clears throat> in Zoom, you can, yes, in Zoom, you can create. Uh, how does that group work? It works okay. It works okay. Yeah. Like, uh, um, I don't know the, what, what kind of problems you might see here. It's just like, it's even better than in the classroom. Yes. Because, you know, when you work in the classroom and you have, let's say 20 students and you ask them to work in groups there is a lot of you know um, kind of noise in the classroom there's this buzz that could be um, kind of distracting for some of the students when they work in breakout rooms they are just the four or three or five people in one room and i think it's easier for them to communicate like my students never complained so uh, uh, I think it is it is actually even maybe better to work uh, online when we uh, have breakout rooms. Uh, actually, I you know the best way to uh, not to be afraid of using breakout rooms or of putting your students into groups in breakout rooms is to do it yourself. And last year I studied um, um, the 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 brain expert studies like at the Polish university. And we had a few sessions online and we worked in groups in breakout rooms and it was so much fun. And it was really, I, for me, it was even better than, than um, you know, the the face-to-face -face meetings because yeah, I had this comfort of working with just two or three people at the same time uh, without the other groups disturbing me. So yeah, it, it worked really, really, really nicely, and it was uh, it was okay. Okay, uh, so now activate study, study uh, activate stage. Sorry, <laughs> this is the, the the stage where we produce um, practice and produce new language. Yes. Yeah? So uh, at the end of almost every unit in your course book, there is this task usually like speaking activity, discussion, debate, where we ask uh, our students to. Um, to use the, the language um, in, in, a, in a new context. And um, quite often, because the books were not uh, written at the time of pandemics, uh, quite often the tasks are like, for example, here is the example from Gold Experience, where there's a beautiful lesson about uh, identity box. And the last task is plan your identity box, work in person, discuss the things. So you can see that students are asked to plan it because they are... Um, in a classroom, they are not at home, so they cannot create their, an identity uh, box. They can simply plan it. But now that we work online, we can actually do it. And that's what I did with one of my uh, groups. Uh, this is just a kind of a very small piece of the, the group. Uh, I asked them uh, to think of their identity desk. So uh, I asked them to look around and, and look at that desk and gather a few things that they think might be a good representation of their personality or of their lives. And they just simply presented uh, the items uh, 
um, on their camera. Of course, I made sure that they hide their faces because I, I knew I would be using it uh, in, a, in a session. Uh, but as you see, it worked really nicely, and we can actually do it. We don't have to. Uh, we don't have to plan it. Yes, our students can produce the language uh, immediately at at the given uh, moment. Um, one more thing I quite often do at this stage is I ask my students to write something. But it often looks like that. Yes, describe yourselves in, yourself in three words. Lazy. Yes, my students don't like writing. I don't know why, but generally that's that's how it is they 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 have a problem with it <clears throat> but since they don't like it uh, i try to uh, to do the writing um, in a in a slightly different way yes they don't like writing long task texts so when i have a lesson um had a lesson about living spaces, for example, and we uh, we talked about um, the, the different cities and different um, uh, space in the city. There was a lot of vocabulary I wanted them to uh, to remember, like describing places, what they can use, um, and and they can describe the, the vocabulary they can use to describe places. Sorry, for I'm mumbling. Um, uh, I what I do quite often as the activate um, uh, task, I ask them to use key vocabulary and summarize the text or the lesson content, which is even um, um, more often in my case. I ask them to summarize the lesson content in four, three or two sentences, depending on the content of the lesson. OK, so we, this is this actually <clears throat> is. Um, why I think it's a good activity, because they have to analyze the vocabulary uh, that we covered in this lesson. Uh, then they have to um, think critically about the content of their lesson. Uh, I, I encourage them, quite often I encourage them to, um, to write um, the summary in which they also tell me how they feel about the content of the lesson. Like, was it clear? Was it interesting? Why was it interesting? Uh, and, and so on. And then um, they have to write it. They don't have to write long text, it's just, you know, four sentences, three sentences. It's not much, but there's a lot of thinking and a lot of analyzing the uh, the vocabulary mostly that we covered in our lesson. Uh, and the last thing, uh, the last idea I have to share um, with you today about the Activate study is again one of my favorites. Uh, I call it the circle of friends, friends inverted commas, because uh, it's not actually friends, it's the circle of five words. Uh, so what I do um, here you can see the, the words are connected with describing uh, places. Yes, so when we have five words, I, I just pick five words that I want my students to, um, to remember uh, and to practice and to produce new sentences using this um, um, vocabulary. Uh, I pick five words and just draw a, draw a circle like that, a circle of five <laughs> circles, and I put the words inside. And here you can do many different things. Quite often what I do is ask my students to, for example, find a connection between the two neighboring words. Like what's the connection um, um, between vibrant and cozy? Then we move on. What about cozy and quaint? How about quaint and shabby? And so on. We can also ask them to find the differences. Or you can ask them to write uh, or, or create um, um, or prepare a speech using all these five words. Like there are many different options uh, that you can uh, work with. Uh, but I quite often ask them, can these five words be friends? This is one again one of the challenging questions. Yes, like and why? Of course, the the the, the word why is like something that sh sh teachers should have tattooed on their forehead. Uh, so the circle of uh, friends, the circle of five, you can you can remember it uh, as something like that. It really works fantastically. So please do try it and uh, do it with your students, and you will see that there's a lot of. Um, uh, 
production, there are a lot of thinking, a lot of analyzing the the meaning, uh, the form, um, the, the the context. So when students have to use the words in sentences, they they can notice uh whether it's okay or not of course i monitor and make uh, correct mistakes give them feedback at this uh, at this uh, stage of the activity okay and the fourth part of our esap <coughs> framework is practice uh which basically is homework but my students hate the H word, they don't like it. So I don't use it in my classroom. I don't say, okay, for homework today, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. I usually say, okay, guys, so now let's talk about your independent practice. <laughs> they of course laugh at me, but they know that, okay, that's okay, Mrs. Kanya, it's no, no problem. We will do some independent practice. And here I use interactive online workbook. Uh, which is called My English Lab. Uh, and basically, I enjoyed my saved time. Yes, I don't have to do anything. Yeah, okay, more or less. But why My English Lab is so great? Because when our students um, do the assigned tasks, uh, Mel um, gives them automated scoring uh, and reports the, the, um, the, the results to the students and to me. Uh, the, um, my English lab gives them instant feedback so they can immediately see where they made a mistake. Yeah, it's good for learning because they can notice what they have to work on. Uh, and for me, it gives me um, the, the outline, it gives me the description of the student's performance. I can see the results, like who did the homework and how did they do it. And there is one fantastic thing at my English lab is the common error report. This is something that Mel generates for me, yes, after the lesson. I have uh, one report in which I can see <clears throat> what mistakes my students made uh, and um, like what I can, uh, what I have to work on or what, I, what do I have to pay attention to uh, when planning my le next lesson. So I make sure that I use the information from common error report and incorporate it into my engaged study where I want to uh, use some retrieval practice, do some retrieval practice with my uh, students. Okay, so this is uh, this is something fabulous. Let me let me say it that way. Um, okay, so I hope I managed to present um, I, I managed to present the uh, the ESA framework quite clearly hopefully if not just 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 write any any questions you have we still have a few minutes so um i i think we can uh, we can talk about it uh, i hope i showed you that you can craft a good online lesson remembering that an online lesson is still a lesson um i hope you enjoyed my my um tips and and different uh, resources and techniques i use but there is one more thing i want to um, make sure you remember about is the human aspect Okay, remember that um, effective pedagogy is not enough. Yes, we are human. Our students are human beings. We have emotions. The situation uh, around us, the reality is, is quite difficult and everybody is fighting its own um, battle. So we have to keep it in mind. So remember that emotions can hinder and facilitate learning. So make sure you find time to ask your students how they are how they um, how they manage, uh, how do they feel, and so on and so on. It just takes a few minutes, and it really um, I think um, might help them learn. So uh, keep talking to your students and keep um, being connected. And in in terms of keeping talking, um, we want we at Pearson wants want, want you to to keep teaching, keep learning, and keep talking. So if you have any ideas and any uh, experience with the ESAP um, framework, please do share your thoughts, your, uh, your ideas. Maybe you have any questions. Uh, you can find, that, find um, us on Facebook under the hashtag ESAP. Uh, so it would be great. I would be very happy to, to engage into any conversation with, uh, with any of you. Uh, you can also follow us at english.com uh, slash isap and uh, so from me that's all, that's that's all stay strong guys uh, <clears throat> i hope uh, you enjoyed the session and you found it 
um, useful and helpful. So thank you for being here and thank you for being so active. It was a real pleasure for me to, to meet you guys. <laughs> okay, I will go through the uh, chat box now and if you have any, any questions, so uh, I can still, I think, spend a minute or two to talk to you. Thank you for so many nice words. <clears throat> okay. Some recording of my lesson. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, actually, I can invite you to my lesson if you want. <laughs> Just drop me a line. Mm -hmm. When you've, I've got only two students, how can I use the breakout rooms? Well, actually, I don't think you can use breakout rooms when you have two students um, because uh, like what's the point when you have uh, two people in the classroom to just do everything um well in the classroom in in the room i think you just have to work with them um as they are uh, does every student need to buy a book to be able to use the lab and the portal um the pearson english portal is something that you use as a teacher and you share your screen uh, with your students yes and um, when you have questions about the, uh, the books and the codes and so on, I think the best way is to, uh, to find your local Pearson group and just ask them a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not the expert at the, all the, you know, technical stuff. I'm just a teacher trainer <laughs> sharing my experience here. <clears throat> okay. Okay, now, so guys, I can see some questions. So let me just scroll a bit. Mm -hmm. How I check writing and spelling. Well, when my students um, do uh, the writing activity, I usually create a Google form, uh, a Google document uh, in, and I give uh, access, I share it with my students. And when, for example, when I have a few students working together, I, I create um, a, a chart, a table, and they just have their own space, each of them. So while they write, I can, um, uh, I can uh, watch what they are doing and uh, give them feedback um, instantly. So that's, that's what I do. Or they can send me the, the written assignment as a document and I send it back to them uh, with my comments. Mm -hmm. The Evolutions Language Notebook with your students. No, I haven't, Luis Gonzalez. Uh, the Evolutions Language Notebook with my students. No, I haven't, but I will look into it. Do I speak, do you speak native language during lessons with A1 students? Of course I do, uh, just the foreign language in, uh, and in this case, how? Uh, I use the, um, my, my native language, you know, because I, I teach, I'm Polish and I teach Polish students. So sometimes and quite often it's easier for me um, to connect with them. And what I do is I have this system that if I explain grammar, I do it in my native language because you know, with, with lower level students, of course, um, because I don't want to kind of waste time um, on, um, you know, explaining something which my students might not understand. Uh, I want them to grab the idea, grasp the idea. And then thanks to the fact that I use my native language, I have more time to practice. Yeah, so using the, the, the first language is absolutely not a problem and you shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, I think it's even even better. Yeah? Sometimes when you, um, I don't remember, it was Paul, uh, who was this? There's a book about how, how, how vocabulary is learned. 
all nation, I think. And he also mentions, the, I think that was him, uh, that using your first language is actually helpful because it creates a, a very um, quick and easy connection in our students' brain. Yes, they can associate the word, the English word with the Polish word, and it's easier for them to retrieve later. Uh, after that, of course, we have a lot of practice with, you know, synonyms, explaining the um, definitions and, and so on. Yes. Okay. I, um, uh, Nurdiana, as a new teacher, I got a lot of information from you. Thank you. I'm very happy <laughs> to share it with you. And I, I, I'm glad you found it useful. Uh, okay. We have one minute. Good. Share, 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 share. Uh, okay, I can't see any questions. So thank you very much, guys, for being with me. It was really a pleasure. And uh, hopefully see you somewhere else, some day, <laughs> somewhere, someone. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye.